Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another Gaudi Mitzpez 22.com Podbean podcast and YouTube video on my blog. I am joined once again by uh, his his excellency, the most reverend James D. Conley, uh, Bishop of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, my hometown. Uh, he is the grand poobah, the El Jefe of the Diocese of Lincoln. Uh, so it's, it's very special to me for a lot of reasons. Those of you, I mean, I've had Bishop Conley on my show before. So those of you who have listened to those know that uh, uh, Jim, as I call him, Jim and I, Bishop Conley and I went to seminary together both undergraduate level, St. Pius X in Erlanger, Kentucky, and then uh, in the theology at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, Maryland. So we've known each other for many decades, and uh, it's just a joy, a joy, a joy that he is now the bishop of my hometown. So Bishop James Conley, welcome to the show once again. Great to be on the show again, Larry. It's always good to be with you, always to catch, good to catch up. Yes, it is always good to catch up. I just want to begin before we launch into this. I have one announcement to give to my listeners and viewers, and it is this, that I am about to head home to Lincoln, Nebraska uh, for a couple of weeks, actually, because uh, my parents are elderly and ill. My mother has dementia, and it's just reaching those sorts of end of life kind of decisions that one has to make. And I need to be back home uh, and helping my siblings make these decisions. So two things I would ask that you keep my parents and my family in your prayers and also to realize that. They're probably I'm, I'm not slated to have another new podcast for a couple more weeks. So there will be a lull in the podcast. So Bishop Conley, you'll be my last podcast partner here for for a couple of weeks. So it's well, going to have we better make this one count, man. We will. We'll try our we'll try our best. But it's it's providential that it's all focused here in Lincoln. So you'll be home. Busy That's right. Family. I'll be home. And before we get it, we're going to talk about a pastoral letter you've issued on Catholic education. But I do want to say, OK, I am. Another reason I'm coming home is next Saturday is a big football game in Lincoln. The, the dreaded, hated Colorado Buffaloes will be coming into town with Bishop Bishop. Gosh, Coach Prime, Coach Deion Sanders heading. the uh, And uh, my beloved Cornhuskers will be playing. And I just have one question for you. The, the Cornhuskers seem to have had their fortunes revived with the new quarterback, Dylan Rayola. Many people don't remember their glory years in the 70s, 80s and 90s, especially. Uh, and now they're, they're sort of rising from the ash. I just have one question for you. You're originally from Wichita. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, well, Diocese of Wichita. You went to the University of Kansas, a nice basketball school. Uh, I assume, though, that you now have Husker loyalties. I would hope that you have Husker loyalties, right? Well, how could you not have Husker loyalties living in this state? I mean, everything revolves around Nebraska Husker football game and you know, football team. So it's, uh, of course I do. And it's, uh, it's exciting because I think it's kind of, in a way, Nebraska football is unique because first of all, it's the only really, well, there's Nebraska volleyball and the girls is really on the rise right now, yeah. but uh, yeah. Nebraska football is really the only game in town. I mean, we don't have a professional uh, football team or baseball team or basketball team in the state. So <clears throat> it's really kind of quintessential college football at its best, you know, the old style college football. Yeah. And everybody, you know, everybody in the state from east to west, north to is a is a Husker fan. There's no other rivalry. It's all Huskers. It's all Huskers all the time. And my wife, my lovely wife, is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. So this household here on a football Saturday, which was two days ago, is always just devoted to college football, college football all day on Saturdays. Uh, and both Nebraska and Notre Dame got off to a good start. I do remember that on the early 2000s, Nebraska had a home and home series with Notre Dame. And my wife and I had to watch from separate rooms. There was just no way I could pretend that I was in any way, shape or form, hoping for anything good to happen for Notre Dame on either one of those games. Uh, but anyway, excited. A house divided. Anyway, uh, Bishop Conley has just issued a, a new pastoral letter called The Joy and Wonder of Catholic Education, Developing Authentically Catholic Schools. Uh, it's not super long. It's a, uh, as I printed it off on my printer, it's, it's about nine pages or so, nine or ten pages long. But it is densely packed. In fact, I'm just I'm, and I'm not just saying this because Bishop Conley is an old friend of mine. Uh, I think this is one of the most meaningful documents put out by a single bishop in the United States on 
on Catholic higher education that I've read that I've read in quite a long time. So I actually I'm this is providential. I mean, I, I, I had you come on here mainly because I wanted to chat with my old friend again. But to have this wonderful document in my hands right here uh, that you have just recently penned. So I'm going to start with something simple before we actually what what motivated you to want to write a pastoral letter on Catholic education amongst all the things that you could have written a pastoral letter on why on Catholic education? Well, a couple of things, Larry, um, you know, as I kind of, uh, look at, uh, sort of my final years as a Bishop, uh, I, hopefully I've got a few more, hopefully I'm, I'm in the fourth quarter, but maybe I got some overtime. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting at that age where I'm sort of seeing the finish line at the end. And I'm thinking, what is it that I want to devote the last years of, uh, my Episcopate too. And um, it, it, what came, kept coming in my mind is that, that Jesus was both a teacher and a healer. So education and healthcare were two areas that the Catholic Church have been involved in since apostolic times. So uh, I wanted to devote my energies to education and healthcare. You know, I'm also the National Episcopal Advisor to the Catholic Medical Association. But education especially here in the Diocese of Lincoln, because as you know, growing up here, we have a great legacy of Catholic education, going back especially to Bishop Flavin, Bishop Rusk, what's built on. And so the schools have been very, very important uh, here in the life of the Diocese of Lincoln. And most of our vocations, I think, mean, are the reason why we are flush with priests. I mean, we've got, I think, the lowest median age of priests in the country. Um, we've got 150 priests uh, in, a, in a diocese of 96,000. So we probably have more priests per people, you know, per Catholic in the country. And I think the reason for the, the, and that's not to mention religious life as well and good families, but I think part of the reason is because of a strong Catholic school system. But the culture has, um, you know, become so um, antithetical to Christian values and becomes more and more secular by the moment. Um, Catholic education can be a great uh, force of, of, of good and truth, truth and beauty in, in the midst of a, a kind of a wasteland. So that's the first reason. Second reason is, as you know well, my own experience in education, my conversion to the Catholic faith came yes. through a great books program, which I mentioned in the pastoral letter, the Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas, which changed my life. And it wasn't uh, any kind of a religious program at all. It was a big, it was in a big university like University of Nebraska, KU, a very liberal university. And yet there was this wonderful, great books program in the humanities department. So uh, that's where I was immersed for the very, in, in, in the great works of, of Western literature. So I always tell people the liberal arts converted me to the Catholic faith. You know, it wasn't, it was way before RCIA and any of the, you know, the, the, you know, catechetical programs. It was really reading great books that yeah. brought me to the Catholic faith. So those two things um, have been on my mind for a long time. And so, so that's what kind of inspired this pastoral letter. Yeah, and I thought that was one of the uh, best things about the pastoral letters because I know you, and I, I I loved I knew your story, but I loved rereading your story. Uh, you know, at, from being at the University of Kansas, you came in as a non-Catholic, and uh, what did you originally intend to major in when you when you were there? Environmental studies. I wanted to be a forest That's right. ranger. That's right. A forest ranger. That's like my older brother wanted to be a forest ranger too when he was a when he was a young pup. So yeah, so you get there and you're doing all this. It, and I remember the first time I met you at St. Pius X Seminary, you were like this this little bespeckled guy, a little John Lennon round glasses. You were like this little hippie guy, fresh, fresh off the organic farm, you know? Uh, so yeah, Mr. Environmental Studies. And uh, right, right. Back so, to but, nature. But, yeah, but that goes to point to something I, serious here, which is I think one of the things that comes out in your story and it's in the pastoral letter is uh, the extent to which uh the 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 life of poetry, the life of imagination, the, the life of a kind of rootedness in the natural world is kind of one of the things that the integrated humanities program did for you. It wasn't just reading great books. It was the whole program kind of breathed fire into the equations of your imagination that kind of lit you on fire. Is, is that a way of putting it, perhaps? Uh, absolutely. You know, in fact, the professors themselves used to talk about the poetic mode of learning. 
And it is an interesting story. I, I gave the uh, commencement address a year ago at Thomas Aquinas College in California, and I had to do some uh, research because I wanted to find uh, these letters that were an exchange of letters between one of my professors, one of the three professors who taught the humanities program, John Sr. And he um, he eventually became my godfather. And uh, John Sr. Uh, was a great friend with Ronald MacArthur, who was the founding president of Thomas Aquinas College. And they would have these summer seminars where they'd get together in Wyoming because <clears throat> Dr. Sr. was at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And they would talk about the crisis in education. And this conversation was very interesting because um, MacArthur, and they were good friends, used to say, you know, John, uh, the crisis in, in education, higher education, is the crisis of reason. You know, young people are not thinking correctly anymore. We need to teach logic and Thomas Aquinas. We need to get them thinking correctly. And then uh, Dr. Senior would 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 uh, come back and say, well, Ron, I don't disagree with you. He says, but I think it's really a crisis of the imagination. Before we can restore the reason, we have to restore the imagination. They have no poetry. They have nothing in their imaginations and their memories. And so we have to start even further upstream and address the crisis of the imagination. Oh, God, that is so true. I'm reminded of a quote from uh, my guy, uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar, at the very beginning of his theological aesthetics in the English version. I think it's even like on page 13 that early, where Balthasar says, in a world robbed of beauty, and by beauty, he means the whole panoply here, art, imagination, poetry, in a world that doesn't, in a church that doesn't first lead with beauty, lead with poetry, the reason for embracing the true becomes lost. Mm. He says syllogisms can still clatter away, being cranked out by rotary presses one after the other. And yet the very, the very reason for embracing the true and the good becomes lost when there's no attractiveness to it, when there's no fire, like I said, fire in those equations, no poetry, no beauty. And so I was so happy to see, you know, so let's let's um, let's begin at the beginning of this document where you, you actually lead off by defining the word education. And you point out that it comes from the Latin educare, which means to lead out of to lead through. What what is the implication of that or the very the etymology of the word itself? Well, it's 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 really kind of mysterious because. The, it, it kind of presumes that there's something already in us, you know, that needs to be drawn out. And, and again, that gets to the heart of, of, of anthropology, you know, Christian anthropology, that we were made in the image and likeness of God. So in our very being, you know, there are things that are, that are, that are attributes of God, which just are latent there in a certain sense, um, that need to be drawn out and developed. And um, it's not a matter of, of, purely inputting you know yeah. information but it's drawing out something that's written into our dna and to our souls and it needs to be brought out and nurtured and developed and created and the greeks knew this you know the greeks knew this uh in you know the whole idea of the paideia in the in greek culture uh yeah. you know they discovered that and it was a matter of of drawing out something uh that was already part of who we are as human beings made in the image and likeness of or was a plato plato who said you know that all learning is a form of anamnesis it's just a, yeah all learning is simply a form of recovering or remembering what has been lost right right and the memory you know it's like uh the um the, the our professors used to talk about the muses education by the muses which is the greek you know the nine muses which were the muses yeah. of memory they were the muses of memory and they, the, the muses uh, came together to develop, you know, the, the whole uh, adventure of, of learning. Oh, yes. The, I'm reminded of the first lines of Homer's Iliad. Sing, O muse, of the wrath of Peleus, his son Achilles. You know, so all of so much of Greek thought was tied to the to the inspiration of these muses, you know. Uh, in a sense, infusing us, not just with new knowledge, but just sort of prompting us to remember mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is already sort of part of the fabric of who we are. And that leads to freedom. So that then leads to the next point you make here, where in, in the very beginning, where you talk about liberal arts and that the word liberal is rooted in the Latin liber, which means to be free, you know, freedom. So the liberal arts are meant to be leading us to freedom, right? Right, right. They free us from, 
from ignorance, they free us from error, they free us from distortion and uh, lack of clarity, and and they bring to us, um, you know, through through the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty, um, a, a a clarity which then leads to freedom, and uh, and freedom is really what we all seek, you know, to be free as as children of God, as as beloved sons and daughters of the Father. And that freedom from sin as well, right? We understand ourselves. We know our human because we're again the, the 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 you know the fall and original sin is what we're struggling with, and so we need to be you know we we need to be free yeah. of those of the shackles of sin and our own weakness uh, in order to walk. Uh, and, you know, the truth will set us free, as Jesus said. Yeah, you know, ignorance is enslaving because. If you're ignorant of the truth, then you become enslaved to a set of illusions. And we're so prone because of our sins, so prone to these illusions. So how ironic is it? And that's why I love this pastoral letter. You know, there's so much of so much of modern so-called liberal education has become quite illiberal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In fact, remember one of our professors, Father, Father Holly, Father Cornelius Holly, the wonderful Irish. Taught us our Greek. Father. Yeah, that's why he taught us our Greek and Latin and, and Latin. well read man. He says, you know, um, really, the, the, the liberal is the most illiberal person, really, because, uh, you know, it, they, they, they force, you know, because it doesn't come freely, they force it on you. you know? Oh, he was he was so great. So patient. Uh, I remember one day not to go down too far memory lane. He was standing at the chalkboard. He, you know, he used to toss that chalk in the air. In his, and he'd catch it in his hand, and he was trying to get somebody who didn't know their Greek very well to do something. I remember which some seminarian. And the seminarian got it wrong and got it wrong and got it wrong. And so Father Holly, with his little county cork grin on his face, ah, well, well, I guess then we just need to start all, all over, over again. again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I have so many Hollyisms in my mind, you know. Remember another thing he said, he defined the memory. He says, gentlemen, <laughs> the memory is a faculty that forgets. <laughs> he, yes. he defines it in the negative, not that it remembers. That's right. The memory is a faculty that forgets. That forgets. And it's pertinent to what we're talking about here, because the pedagogy of, of a proper liberal arts education is going to have uh, an awareness of the foibles of human nature, that the memory is is a faculty that forgets and needs the discipline of a good teacher. And also it, uh, the good teacher is going to have to be patient and start all over again. And, and in a sense, not get angry when, when, you know, the student doesn't quite get it right the first time. Um, but okay. And, so and, and repetition, go ahead. repetition is the mother yes. of learning. I mean, we all have to repeat and that was one of the things, for example, in learning poetry at the University of Kansas, we would go through these, rep, you know, we'd, we'd have these recitations where you'd again, 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 you know, the, the repetition, That's which right. is so important for memory. Oh, yes. I remember my German teacher in high school. No, kein mal. One more time. Yeah. <laughs> no, kein mal. One more time. All right. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, so repetition, repetition, repetition. So at the very, uh, as we get through these preliminaries, uh, in, in quoting Archbishop J. Michael uh, Miller, who was secretary for Congregation for Catholic Education at the Vatican, he examined a, a whole number of papal documents on education. And, and, I, and then you follow then his five essential marks of a Catholic education as you unfold your document here. And those five essential marks are one, that it, uh, Catholic education is inspired by a supernatural vision. Second, it is founded on Christian anthropology. Third, it is animated by communion and community. Fourth, it is imbued with a Catholic worldview throughout its curriculum. And five, it is sustained by gospel witness. These are the benchmarks. So why don't we uh, sort of just sort of systematically go through each one of these five categories, if you don't mind. And so let's start with the very first one, uh, that a Catholic education needs to be an education inspired uh, by a supernatural vision. Absolutely. And, you know, and we're, you know, we're created for eternity, you know, and I think that the, that's the end, right? That That's really yeah. what our goal, our goal is. But, um, but, but, but our life is not just a means to that end. It's infused all along the way with glimpses 
of yes. supernatural reality. And so that's an inspiration. You know, that's an inspiration for us to continue to do, to dive deeper and deeper into the mystery of, of the human person and in and, and, and learning. So having a supernatural vision, which is so contrary, you know, to, let's say, a secular vision, because it doesn't believe that there's, uh, you know, that there's this supernatural yes. world, invisible world that's that's out there. And that really kind of... Uh, the invisible world um, inter intervenes in the visible world if we have eyes to see it. You know, that, 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 that this whole idea of a sacramental imagination, that the things, the world is charged with the grandeur of God, as, as Hopkins said, so that we have to be able to see it in every, in every aspect of our life. But in order to do that, we have to be trained to see it with the eyes of faith. And it's a, it's a gift as well. But that supernatural vision is so important uh, to begin with. Oh, it sure is. I mean, I almost leapt out of my chair when you started with this one uh, as I was reading it. I was reading it to my wife because this is a common theme in so much of what I write on my blog and some of my podcasts, which is what, what really characterizes the modern world more than anything is a deep, constitutive, structured world of unbelief, of, of, of skepticism about anything that can't be measured skepticism about anything that's non-material uh sort of the warp and woof of modernity therefore in its core is this fundamental denial of the supernatural and its reality and it has just always struck me because i feel it in my own bones i'm not waving a, a judgmental finger here at others as i often like to say i am infected with the same bacillus of modern skepticism that everybody else is and that's why i can speak to it almost con naturally to almost every believer that's out there, the, the person who is a, a modern believer, one who truly believes it is, a, it is a belief that has had to go through the crucible of doubt, skepticism, and so forth. And, and therefore, a Catholic education has got to address this right from the get go with young people that are swimming in this ocean of materialistic, naturalistic, reductionistic, technocratic culture. And so I was so happy to see you started with this. You have to believe in the supernatural. Right, right. You know, and of course, we're all children of the Enlightenment. And uh, this is really where it all kind of began. And it's been developed and continues to kind of march forward, uh, even, even with a greater intensity uh, in our own time. And so that's what we're fighting against, this, this, this kind of total secular view of the world. It, 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 if you can't quantify it, if you can't define it scientifically, then then it really is not real. Now, those are people, people do have faith. Well, that's fine and nice for them and everything. That's all nice <laughs> to eat and stuff. But he says, but, but really, if you want to be serious, you don't believe that there's, there's something beyond what we can see and test and, and verify empirically. That's right. And, and that's, that is just uh, in our mother's milk. It's in the air that we breathe, even if we're raised in strongly Catholic families. It's the dominant ethos of our culture. But then there's another aspect to this, and you, and you note it sort of here in paragraph number two under supernatural vision. Uh, and, and that is that, you know, materialism actually is, is a pathway to unfreedom. It's a, it's a pathway to slavery. So you see, a Catholic education also teaches baptized students to live in the glorious freedom of the children of God. As students come to understand the immense privilege uh, of baptism, they learn what it means to be temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, once again, I, I just think that is so timely and, and so true to remind people that the faith liberates, that the faith kind of gives us access to something rather exciting, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the super, I mean, that's right. The supernatural is kind of exciting, isn't it? Right. Right. And it's, it's, it's expansive, you know, it's, it's ever new, you know, it doesn't limit, you know, I think it was Pope Benedict uh, says, you know, that famous line, you know, you don't lose anything, you know, by, by embracing faith, you gain everything, you know, that your, your horizons become much more expansive. You become the, 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 the pursuit of, Life, uh, it becomes much more interesting uh, and, and instead of being confined, you know, to sort of a limited view. It's it, it's exciting, you know, and again, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's true, you know, and oh, geez, I don't want to lose my I almost dropped all these, which would have been a disaster because then I would have been picking up loose papers all over the floor. And this interview would have been out of order. But anyway, I mean, 
for example, I just noticed when I taught my, and I don't necessarily want to really uh, go down this rabbit hole, but you know, I think sometimes as Catholics, uh, Catholic educators, especially towards young people, we forget the allure of the supernatural and we forget that people really do thirst for it. And so I think therefore we underplay the importance of signs of the supernatural that really are there in terms of the Like I know when I taught my theology classes, even on a college level, if I would start talking about things like Eucharistic miracles or the shroud of Turin things, I mean, the student eyes, even the most hard bitten skeptic, their, they, their eyes would light up and they were instantly interested. And now that doesn't mean, you know, that we, that our faith is tied to signs or proofs or things like that, but also we don't want to, in a sense, miss, these little love letters from God, <laughs> where right. he's sort of tapping us on the shoulder and saying, hey, why don't you take a look over here? Look what I look what I did over here. You know, well, do, do, you, do you do you see that, too? Well, absolutely. I mean, the lives of the saints, you mentioned this, you know, the miracles of the saints. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating for people like, if, you know, it, it, both religious and non-religious, you know, when or out of body experiences. I mean, all these books talk to talking about people who have sort of scenes that white light or something people are fascinated they want to believe that there's more than what we see in front of us they want to believe that that's right but they've been convinced that well if you're really serious intellectually you, you, that's religious stuff is really not you know that that's just fairy tale but they want to believe it and they want to they want to be shown that there is something mysterious and well i think you know for example um the Fellowship of the Ring, you know, that, that popularity of that movie by yeah. Tolkien and, 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 and all of these other authors that enjoy a great popularity because they introduce us to a world that's beyond what we can see. And people want to believe that people, people, want, to know, believe or, in, people want to believe in fairies, you know, they do the ethics of Elfland. I mean, or, or even, you know, even though I'm not as big a fan of this as I am as Lord of the Rings, uh, the Harry Potter books, for example, I know a lot of people don't Oh, don't read Harry Potter. It introduces kids to the occult. But, at the, you know, at the very I'm not certain I agree with that. But at the very least, what it gives evidence of is that people are seeking once again, a reenchanted world. The, one of the reasons why people are drawn to the Lord of the Rings, I mean, there's a wizard and they want to live in the Shire uh, yeah. and not in their cul-de-sac in the suburbs. So, you know, how cool would it be to live in the Shire with a wizard? And and so and so, yeah, there's there's this it's it's an appeal to the poetic once again, to the to the right. mysteriousness of wonder and that there are things that go bump in the night that can't be explained. Yeah, that's why I think the, uh, the I, I talk about that at the very beginning, the the motto of the Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas was that yes. wonderful phrase by that prolific author, Anonymus, Nascantur Cantor, in admiratione. Yeah. Nascantur, let them, uh, yeah. Let them be born in wonder. You know, let, let them, them be, be born in wonder. And, 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 Nascantur and, and admiratione. Let them be born in wonder. Yes. Yes. And I wrote that down and meant to say it. So I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you did, because that's like the whole motto of my life as an educator. Yeah. 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 You know, it's funny because I remember back and I talk about this a little bit that in my high school years, you know, I was not uh, I was not anywhere near religion or any, you know, I, I wasn't I, I probably was a happy pagan more than anything else. Uh, maybe it maybe an, uh, an agnostic, yeah. never an atheist. But I remember, you know, and of course I was, as I mentioned, you know, my, my, my goals were, you know, sports and the Grateful Dead, you know, those were kind of what I was, that was my world. And then I saw this brochure that I got at a, at a college fair and in the front of the brochure had a typical college kid of the, of the, of the seventies, long hair. We all had long hair. We all had oh, hair back then. Believe it or not, I had long hair. You had long hair. We had Everybody hair. Did. Everybody we had hair. Prove it. Um, and so it had a picture of this kid in a Kansas at night in the Kansas wheat field, you know, looking up at the stars. And you could see the Big Dipper in the background, just looking up at the stars. And 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 then that 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 inscription, Nascantur and Admiratione, let them be born in wonder. And I saw that brochure and that that's that caught my imagination and I and that's I opened it up and I started reading about this very unusual they call they called this course an experiment in tradition and because they had to be kind of it had to be kind of edgy and avant-garde in the 70s it couldn't be you know and so they, that's, oh, that's, how, right. that's how they pitched the program and actually got an 
a, a, a huge grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to put this program on at the University of Kansas. So um, it, it was just edgy enough uh, to kind of catch your, your attention uh, but the whole idea of being reborn in the wonder and looking up the stars was sort of a motif. You look up at those stars and you think, wow, those are pretty awesome. You know, and how yeah. do those stars stay up there? What- hey, but uh, I want to go down a, a, a slightly different rabbit hole because this uh, before we move on to the next point, which is and it, but it goes to the reason why we need a definite Catholic alternative in the educational sphere to the dominant secular ethos. Maybe you could share with our view, my viewers, what happened to the integrated humanities program? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it became so successful, you know, because it tr- attracted students who were very curious about this. Um, and then, unbe- un, you know, unforeseen by the professors themselves was students became, became, began converting to the Catholic faith. Um, and actually, the professors were not all Catholic. One of them was not even a Catholic himself at the beginning. Um, and so it was nothing premeditated. They didn't come together and say, let's create right. this program and make Catholics, you know. But because of the fact that there were all these conversions and um, and it was so popular, so there was a little bit of academic envy, you know, uh, students were taking the integrated humanities programs and not taking other classes at the university it became wildly popular. Um, the university got fearful. And um, because, you know, we were a secular university, we're a state state university, and maybe these professors are proselytizing in a state classroom. And so they actually had hearings at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences because a couple of students, a classmate of mine, her father was a Unitarian minister. And right. he, along with the American Civil Liberties Union, filed a suit against the university for violation, accusing them of violation of church and state. So they had these hearings, which made the program even more popular, as you can imagine, these public hearings. <laughs> yeah. And the, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences held these, and he was a good colleague and friend of the three professors, and he knew that this was bogus. But they had to have these hearings. And they, they, they basically threw the case out. There was no evidence of any proselytizing. And I remember even talking to John Sr. Um, said, you know, I, I'm kind of interested in my junior. I said, I'm kind of interested in Catholic Church. You know, can you help me tell me? And we said, well, go go see the parish priest. You know, go see the parish priest. He said, we're, you know, that, that's fine. That's great. But he said, but, the, you know, this is this is a humanities course here. And if you want to pursue a re- religion, go go talk to the parish priest. So they never did any kind of proselytizing. Yeah, yeah. That's good but, to know. But 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 as, but as a result of that, it became uh, and it was on the front page of the Kansas City Star for three consecutive days. Um, and this was a time also where there were a lot of cults. And the Moonies were big, and the Hari Krishnas, you know. So they, they were yeah, they the Catholic cult, you know. And some of the yeah. students were going off to the monastery and that kind of thing. But uh, Jim Jones and Jamestown and, uh, yeah, and all you know, that stuff was going. Yeah, on. all that stuff and heading off to the monastery and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the, the irony of the ACLU and the Unitarian suit against is, is the, once again, it's like you said, still children of the enlightenment, this fundamental attitude that enlightenment based values are not in any way, shape or form, even latently theological don't represent a metaphysical stance and are therefore religiously neutral. So it's perfectly okay for so-called secular professors to to proselytize students actively away from religious faith. And that's not a violation of the Constitution, because after all, those are just neutral secular professors, whereas anybody that might start converting people to Catholicism, even though they weren't actively doing it, that's an immediately suspicious sort of entity. The whole lawsuit in and of itself is paradigmatic, therefore, of, of the modern problematic that we face. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I think it was... Uh... Thanks be to God, it was it was thrown out, and um, yeah. you know these professors were all tenured professors. They'd all won the highest award at the university, the Hope Award, which is voted on by students, um, and so their their reputations were impeccable. And um, there was no there was none of this going on. But yeah, they hit that buzzsaw of uh, yeah. you know yeah. Anyway, okay, I, I wanted to get that out there. So then yeah. the se- the second benchmark is that a Catholic education must be founded on a Christian anthropology. So maybe let's unpack that just a little bit. Well, you, you, you've talked a lot about this, how the important, you know, one of the, I think the greatest challenges we have, um, not only in education, but in healthcare and in civil discourse is, is understanding who we are as human beings, as persons, you know, a, a, a loss of sort of a true anthropology. 
Mm -hmm. And in this, you know, in this technocratic world in which we live, we've been mechanized the human person so much and instrumentalized the human person that we we don't have a, a proper grounding in a true human anthropology. And so beginning uh, as, as a fundamental uh, uh, first principle is we have to understand who we are as human beings and as students in, in teaching realize that those children in front of you, whether they be, you know, kindergartners or high school seniors or college students, uh, have this fundamental, unique human anthropology, which is based upon, again, that supernatural vision that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Got him at Spes 22, baby. Got yeah, him at Spes 20. It's right here. You quoted it. All right. Only uh, a Catholic education also stresses that it is only Christ who fully reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. GS 22, singing right. my song. But the other thing, at the very beginning of this, you note something very interesting, too, I think, which is we need to remember, uh, as you, you alluded to earlier in our conversation, Jesus was a teacher and a healer. I mean, the, one of the most common terms applied to Christ in his lifetime was Rabboni, teacher, teacher. And, and what it underscores, therefore, is the unbelievable dignity of the teaching profession, especially in this sort of Catholic vision, but that there is a didactic content. It, we're not just pouring information into a student. No, we're trying to excite wonder in them, the poetic, but there is content. And in this regard, the truth of the human person, it's absolutely critical that a Catholic education communicate this proper Christian anthropology as teachers. Right, right. The, the, and, you know, and we don't get, if we don't get that right, uh, or if we get, get it just partially right, you know, it's going to lead us off into different directions. Um, and so that's why I think it's, it's such a fundamental first principle is, is, is anthropology is, is in, 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 you know, this, this is, like I said, everything we do, whether it be in education, healthcare, uh, politics you yes. have to have a proper hu human anthropology yeah what's the, what's that great book by wendell berry uh what are people for yeah what are right. people for the great poet wendell berry and and so ultimately a catholic education poses that question of meaning of purpose what are people for why are we here and that therefore this gives us a slightly different concept of what our freedom is for than our secular counterparts that the truth of the human person creates within us a desire for the good. And so we see that our freedom is constitutionally oriented towards the moral and spiritual good, something higher, and not simply this open-ended choosing, like I choose a cheeseburger over a fish sandwich. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, you know, an over-utilitarian uh, view of the human person as, as a consumer or producer or a worker, you know, this whole Marxist uh, where, yeah. where you know it's that that's everywhere you know that we are basically education is about uh preparing workers for the workforce to make a, to be productive in a in an economy that um is fueled you know by by the human resources oh that is so true to this non-utilitarian view that and it's, we, not, and it's we, not, we, we go ahead Oh, go ahead no, yeah go ahead i'm sorry no i was just gonna say we live in this technocratic age where everything has utilitarian end and even the human being, this is one of the problems with technologizing reproduction and IVF and things like this, or technologizing everything, everything about us as a human being now that we seek to digitize it and reduce us to simply a, a machine-like entity of some kind. And that changes everything. Right, right. No, it's in, and that's why I think understanding who we are as human beings uh, and the mystery and the beauty of the human person is, is, is really at the heart of, of, of the education enterprise. Number three, benchmark animated by communion and community. And here you really highlight the role of parents, which I think is important. Right. And then that, that fundamental Catholic principle, social teaching, the parents are the first and primary educators of their children. Because as important as Catholic education is, and I'm all all for Catholic education, I've got a, you know I've got 24 elementary schools and six high schools I got to run. Um, as important as these high schools and, and elementary schools are, parents are the first and primary educators of their children, and the church comes alongside parents to assist them and help them. And you know when you think about it, Catholic schools haven't been around that long. It was up until you know a couple hundred years ago. 
it was really the parents and the community that educated children. And in and, and Catholic education, yeah. in the formal sense of, of elementary and high school. Now, universities and higher education go back into the Middle Ages and even to the Benedictine schools, uh, you know, way back. But as far as the primary educators of children, parents are the primary educators. And when they stand before the altar and they enter into the sacrament of matrimony, they're asked those questions. The third being, will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up, raise them, educate them uh, in, in the teaching of the church? So that education is part of their sacramental duty and responsibility. Oh, it sure is. And, and, I also think it's also why uh, in this section here, uh, communion and community, it is so, so very important for parents to be involved in the parish community uh, that, you know, if, if your child, you, it's one thing to send your child to a Catholic school, but then if, if the truths that are, even if it, let's assume it's a great Catholic school that's following this model that you've proposed, all right, and then the students come home and their parents aren't living it. Or maybe the parents are living it, but all of their friends and social work is outside of the parish and other places, and and nobody they really associate with shares these values either. So it really, really, culture is so important. I think it's very important that in this educational process. I know my daughter went to a Catholic school, and I remember that one of the things that really I enjoyed most about sending her to the Catholic school was that it got me more involved in my parish. Yeah. My My tendency was to be that, pew in the back of the church Catholic, you know, sneak in on a Sunday morning, sit in the back. Please don't touch me. Get away from me. No, I don't want to know your name. Uh, hi, my name is Larry. I hate you. <laughs> 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 then you run out into the parking lot and, you know, engage in miniature road rage as you're trying to get. You know, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But my point was I was a kind of disengaged guy in terms of not wanting to get too involved in the. But as soon as I had a kid in a Catholic school, then, oh, there's so-and-so. Oh, and there's that kid. Oh, and there's that kid. And you get involved in the sporting events. And so on. all of a sudden, I'm involved in the parish. Right. You know, and every uh, if every assignment I've had um, as a priest, you know, especially a parish that had a school, much more involvement by the families if they have children in the school. Uh, parishes without schools are involved as well, but it's, there's something different about a parish with a school. And that's why I think here in the Diocese of Lincoln, we've been so blessed because there's been such uh, strong parish involvement, both in volunteer and activity, but also financially supporting the Catholic schools. You know, and the other thing too is that co and 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 we this is this is one of our biggest uh, yeah, this is the biggest challenges is to uh, is to uh, you know ha engage the parents in 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 forming their children. Like you said, you can undo everything we do at school in just a couple hours at home, if they're not living the faith and if their faith is not informing even their home life and family life, what they're watching on TV, what they're talking about, you know, all those kinds of things. And I can't tell you how many parents have come to me and said, Father, Bishop, I sent my kid to 12 years of Catholic education, spent thousands and thousands of dollars. As soon as he left home, doesn't go to mass anymore. Now that's not the fault of the school, maybe the school wasn't good enough, but, but it's also the fault of family. You know, they have they really have they really allowed their faith to to um, inform every aspect of their life. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, and one thing too, and, and you don't mention in, in in this pastoral letter. It's if I had to make one suggestion, it would be to add one more section, which would be homeschooling is not addressed. And, and I don't, maybe that's because maybe homeschooling isn't big, that big in Lincoln where, you know, the Catholic schools are so good, but I know out here where we live, like my parish has a homeschooling, doesn't have a school, but has a homeschooling cooperative. Uh, and, you know, so parents come from all over and help out and teach classes and, and so on and so forth. So, and that's been a big community building thing as well in our parish. Right, right. Now, I, I make an allusion to thinking outside the box and the way we you do bring education. And that and that's where kind of like a hint, a little hint at, you know, at, at homeschooling and not just homeschooling, but all kinds of different ways to um, to teach. Now, the, the, the standard traditional Catholic school, you know, which is, you know, very important. I mean, we have to be thinking outside the box because especially as this culture continues to unravel, 
um, and it continues to, to go off the rails. We can't be locked into a kind of delivery of education that's this sort of this model that we've always known. We've got, especially since the pandemic, yeah. we saw an explosion of homeschooling after the pandemic. Yeah. You know, and um, so I am, you know, I, we, we do have homeschooling families here in the diocese. And then sometimes it's detention because, you know, when a family decides to homeschool and they yank their yeah. six kids out of our schools, it's like <laughs> in the heart, you know, I and know, I, I my know. Past, my pastors say like, oh, my gosh. And so I remember having a conversation with my pastors, you know, and they, and they were bemoaning the fact and I understand it. They, they work their, you know, what off. In trying to keep the school and then once one of their best families most devout families said we're going to homeschool now and you can you can imagine how it, it affects them but i kind of said look i said fathers you know they're not the enemy you know they, they've, they've decided to to take this literally parents are the first and primary educator and they're going to try to do it themselves so we have to honor that yeah it's terrible that they're pulling their kids out of our schools because they're some of the best kids in the schools um but we have to be open to that and again it's not one size fits all yeah. You know, we have to be open to all kinds. It's it's a whole community effort. The homeschoolers, the kids in the school, kids, even the people who send their kids to public schools. I was a public school kid my whole life. Well, first, Me too. The, I'm the a first, public school guy. Yeah, yeah. The first Catholic school I walked into was Pius the Tenth. You know, in Erlanger. Me know? too. I thought well, this is weird. There's a crucifix on the wall. Yeah. A yeah. Bit no. Bizarre. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a totally. But so so we we, we can't. You know, we, we, we're all in this together and we need to band together. That's why I call this communion, communion and community, that, 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 that it's, it's a whole community effort yeah. um, and with the parents. I know priests are already overworked and, and all that, but I just think in terms of that thinking outside of the box, it could be, you know, in a parish that doesn't have a school. Okay. And there isn't one close by. Maybe you do start a homeschooling cooperative, or even if you have a parish that does have a school, maybe you do the school and have a homeschooling cooperative and the two sort of work together with one another. Um, anyway, that's just me talking. I, that's me adding work to the priest slate, but because <laughs> it's, and it's easy for me to do, <laughs> but anyway, last thing in this section, I think it's important. You note the importance of the, the physical surroundings of a school building. In other words, that a school building should be beautiful to the extent, okay, you know, that it's financially, but it should have things like nice artwork, secular art, as well as religious art. And that to the extent that it's possible that the building have a certain architectural beauty to it and so forth. I think that's really important too. Right. It should be a place that kids want to go to, delightful. There should be a lot of natural light if possible. There should be um, beautiful things on the wall. There should be kind of a homey atmosphere. It's interesting, you know, this this time of year in August, uh, a couple of weeks ago, student uh, teachers show up a week early. And what do they do? They decorate their classrooms. You know, they put up their bulletin boards. You know, they put up. That's their, right. They bring in their little hamster and for the little ones, you know, or their, or their <laughs> people, you know, all these things that, that, that make the make the learning environment beautiful and delightful. So that you, when you come to school, you're not feel like you're coming to an institution uh, oh, or like a short space, but a place that you can that that, that you can play. You know, and, that, and that is so true. I mean, uh, we're about the same age. I think you're a little bit older than I am. But I went to public school, and I remember I went the middle school. We called it junior high back then. Right. The junior yeah. high I went to in Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, you live in Lincoln. I was Goodrich Junior High, which was in Northwest Lincoln, and. Goodwitch was at the time in the 70s was a brand new building. There wasn't in, in this. It, there wasn't a single window in the building. And I mean, that was the mentality of even the 1970s public school that. All right. The, you don't want students looking out all the time. You want their total focus in the buildings. And I just remember thinking even then, how inhuman is this? I hated it. I hated right. every year that I was at that stupid junior. high. Right. right. No, they, there was a time there. And I hope hopefully those those days are gone. When you built schools, they were highly efficient, you know, energy, yes. uh, no windows, you know, an institution, you know, lights, these incandescent lights, those, remember those lights that are just. Oh, like, God, yes. And they're so great. I know the last time I was in Lincoln, I drove by Goodrich Junior High and I noticed they have added windows oh, and probably cost the public. Oh, yeah. They, they added. So somebody along the way got the memo, right? Kids need sunshine. They like looking at trees and whatnot. Okay. So that was great. Anyway, let's move on to number four, imbued with the Catholic worldview throughout the curriculum. Oh, this is so key. 
I think this is one of those important points I make. It is. You know, and they, you hit this notion of integration across disciplines. Right, right. That we, you know, we can have the best religion class in the world. And I think we do in our schools. But if it's just an add on, you know, then and it doesn't permeate or cross pollinate. I'm a beekeeper. I love that word. If it doesn't cross pollinate right. the other subjects then it's not going to be effective. You know, the kids are going to compartmentalize. We're already compartmentalizing our whole life. So they're going to put religion off in this part of my life. And then, but biology, I'm going to be a physics major, but physics is what I'm mainly, that's the real thing, you know? And so, but, it, but the faith has to be, uh, it's like a yeast. I use that term, like a yeast in everything that raises oh, absolutely. the subject up. And teachers model the faith. So even if you're a computer science teacher or a math teacher or a physics teacher, your witness as a Catholic in the classroom comes out, whether you, I mean, as I would often say to students, what I would, uh, I taught, I was a theology professor. So, okay, big, you know, I, I didn't have to necessarily integrate with other disciplines, but the fact is I would tell students at the very beginning of the semester, I'm every education professor's living nightmare. I'm just a talking head lecturer, entertainer slash educator. And, and, and the point is this, is that the class is me and I am the class <laughs> in the sense that I have mastered the subject matter. I've given you some books to read. We're going to talk about them. But if you don't like me, you're not going to like the class. And, and I, I let them know right up front that I'm going to be witnessing to this stuff, that I'm not a neutral observer. Uh, and, and so I really do think, and you mentioned this in here, how important it is that there not be a hypocrisy, a divide between how a teacher lives and then what that teacher is teaching. Right. And students want to know their teachers because yes. teaching and learning is, is a kind of friendship. It's a, it's a unique kind of friendship, but they want, I fell in love with my third grade teacher, Miss Ellis. I was head over heels. She was beautiful, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> and I still can see her face, but I wanted to yeah. know everything about her. I wanted to know how many children she had. I wanted to know what her dog's name was, all these kind of things. Um, now, obviously, you have to be prudent. There's got to be proper boundaries. But yes, they but want, they, they want to know they, they fall in love. I fell in love with many teachers, you know, and that's what you're trying to say. So you're getting you're getting not just an information delivery system. You're being, you're, you know, that, that's why education is much more than information delivery. It's, it's, it's transformation. Yeah. And that comes through friendship. Teachers as mentors, teachers as role models, teachers as somebody that you look up to. We all, I mean, there's not a person listening to this podcast who doesn't know that what we're talking about here, as you look back on your own career, beginning from kindergarten or preschool, all the way up through PhD level graduate school, there are those special teachers in your life that you still remember had a profound impact on your life. And you got to know them on a personal level as friends beyond the classroom. Uh, and, and But that process of communal friendship began in the classroom. Now, do, um, do, if you have something you want to add to that, fine. But otherwise, well, no, I, I, just, I would Go just ahead. say yeah, it, it's a kind of love. It's a love. It's, it's a love that we have, a love for learning, but also a love for those who are sharing and witnessing them, themselves to you that you're kind of with them in this adventure yeah you know i i still remember getting some student evaluations back from my students when i was at the sales and every once in a while it was a kind of it would sting a little bit but it would also be a little uplifting where you'd get an, a comment from a student that would say well dr chap often strays off topic and i'm not certain sometimes how much i learn but dead gummit i really loved his class because i got to know him and, and I think there's some value even there. I mean, as we all know, as teachers, yeah, sometimes there are some semesters where, yeah, you just don't hit it out of the park like others. Uh, and yet there is that gift of you in the classroom that right. still matters. Now, in this same section, one of the things that it, when you talk about integration across disciplines, I think this is this is maybe more important on a high school and college level than lower levels. But it, it bears repeating, which is this. There's probably no such thing, although it's debatable, for example, that there's that there's Catholic math or Catholic psychology or Catholic geography or Catholic physics. But there is such a thing as a physics teacher who happens to be a Catholic or a psychologist who happens to be a Catholic who has made every effort to integrate their Catholic worldview with those disciplines. 
and to teach those disciplines within the light of that Catholic faith. And I think that's what you're talking about here, right? Right. In fact, I mentioned that, you know, how the STEM subjects, science, technology, education, and math can be gateways to, um, you know, to things beyond the actual physical. And we look at the greatest scientists, yes. the greatest inventors, the greatest discoverers were men and women of faith. You know, they yes. had, not all, but many of them did. I always tell this great story. Uh, there was a the story goes, it's in the biography of this great uh, person who I won't reveal until the end. Um, but a short story there, it's in France and, and a bunch of college students are on a train to Paris. And there's an old man looking out the window, you know, thumbing his beads, praying the rosary, you know, and they're making fun of him because these are, you know, university students. And, and they said, old man, you know, this is like back in the 19th century, old man. He says, haven't you, this is science. That religion stuff is all passe now. He says, you need to read this book, you know, and, and they gave him this book. It was something on, you know, I don't know, Darwin or something like that. And so the man said, well, thank you. I'll take that and read it. And so they're getting off the train in Paris. And they said, I don't want to follow up with you, old man. He says, what's your name? And give me your card. So he pulls out his card. It was Louis Pasteur. <laughs> who, uh, who is the president of the French Academy for Sciences. <laughs> yes, I, I know that story well. And I, I so I knew it was headed, but I always love rehearing it. And that's for those who haven't heard it before, that's and, not and apocryphal. Point, that is a true story. That is that, honestly that's a true, true story. story. And the point may, being is that the greatest affili uh, disaffiliation of young people between the 18 and 24 yeah. is this seemingly bifurcation of faith and reason, of science and religion. Baron, Bishop Barron talks about this all the time. Oh, yes. Somehow you can't be, you can't believe in science and be faithful, or you can't be faithful and believe in science. I'm looking up on my bookcase. There's a book up there written by a, a neuroscientist and sociologist named Ian McGilchrist called The Master and Its Emissary. And what he has pointed out is that the, the, uh, side of your brain, I think it's the right brain that is poetic and imaginative, is meant to rule the left brain, the rational part. But we have flipped the script in the modern world. That's why it calls it the master and its emissary. The master has become the left brain and the right brain has become its emissary and it should the other way around. Uh, and in that regard, you end this section by talking about how the liberal arts and poetry and, and those things if they're properly integrated into the STEM disciplines, create a kind of a humility, a kind of epistemic humility that then leads on to greater wonders and, and greater insights beyond that individual discipline. I think this is an important point, uh, this, this understanding of humility on the part of the teacher. Um, because if we look at ourselves as sort of the master, now we are, I mean, the teachers, you know, are the ones who are educated, like you said, and they're ones that have all, you know, they're, 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 this is what they're, they're charged to do. But if we don't have that ability to be um, struck, you know, with, with wonder at, 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 when the light bulb goes off in one of our students, there's a, there's a delight that we have to be, and that's a humility yeah. on our part that we, that, you know, that this came from us. Yeah, maybe through us, but this is, there's a, there's a humility. And that's what the poet, that's why I quote Newman. You know, we have to, st understanding is, is standing below and looking up. And, and that's really what the poetic is all about. And to realize that hopefully the small little pebble you've thrown into the lake in your life will be followed by others throwing much bigger pebbles that, that you, you, that, that there's no arrogance like, Oh, my legacy. I do not want my legacy surpassed. My, no, your legacy should be that you hope that it is surpassed. I remember one of the greatest joys of my life is the fact that I had an undergraduate student once as she was a theater major. Uh, her name was Sarah Hulse and she became interested in theology via my faith and reason course. And I remember her sitting in my office one day, she's a very bright student. And I said to her, Sarah, my dream is that someday you will be sitting in this very office as my replacement. Well, guess what? Sarah Hulse is now Dr. Sarah Hulse Kirby, PhD in theology. And she is sitting in my office as my replacement. And she is uh, probably a far better teacher than I ever was. And, and, and a, maybe a better scholar as well. So, and I, and I don't find any jealousy on that. I am so pleased with that. Probably a great sense of satisfaction, I'm sure. Yeah, it is. It's just, it's tremendous. And any teacher knows that. And, and when you, when you are integrating your discipline in it, with theology and it creates this epistemic humility, 
I, I think that it's a great, great witness in, in Catholic education. Let's move on to then. No, before we do, uh, you, you end this section by talking about, and I think it's important to talk about this, that uh, tech overload, you know, that ed- our education has to be in the meaning business. We give meaning. We, we point out the meanings of things. But in this world of tech, tech, the tech overload. So what is the proper role of technology in our Catholic classrooms? Well, you know, I, I, I debated on whether or not to go down that rabbit hole. And I just have one paragraph, I think maybe two paragraphs. And I quote, yeah, Jonathan, it's not long, but it's there. Yeah. Jonathan Haidt's book, you know, The Anxious Generation, which I think is really yeah. subtle and it's important. He also wrote that book, Coddling the American Mind. But but um, but yeah, that's a whole area which probably devo- probably and maybe that's the next pastoral letter I'll tackle. But the, the use of technology in education and Thanks be to God, um, they're starting to realize that it's, uh, you know, that it's it's it being a de- it's a detriment to, to education. Yeah. Too much of it. Too much of it. I mean, we can't get. I mean, we can't get away from it. It's it's you can't go become luddites and go back to, you know, get back to nature on this. But it, it's here to stay. But how do we use it? You know, how do we control it? How do we, um, especially now that AI is on the horizon, yeah. we're going to have to really think hard. But already, like for instance, in the in the New York public schools, I hear they're banning cell phones, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I, smartphones. So, so this is I a new trend. It's, it's a, a new trend, trend. And, and what and they're discovering that's... is that it's very beneficial. That the students yeah. like it. The right. students are. You think at first they're like, "Oh, you took my phone away." They feel liberated. Liberal arts, liberal, free. Yeah. They feel liberated by the truth of who they are, which are beings meant to be in community with other beings and not with their nose buried, right. you know, and in, to, in a and, device. And to be immersed in the really real. And the, yes. I, say that really real, not only in nature, but real conversations with real people face to face, eyeball to eyeball. You know, that you know, kind of real encounter. I don't think I'm just being an old curmudgeon and nor are you. When I look back at my own childhood and I say to myself, I thank God that I grew up in an era where I ran free in my in my neighborhood with my fellow rugrat neighbor, baby boomer kids playing outside, doing our thing with and not having my nose buried in a video game or text messaging on my phone. And I don't think that marks us off as old curmudgeons, but the recognition that we benefited from. Uh, an environment which is better, better than the environment that is today, I think. Right, right. Absolutely. I agree 100 percent. You know, one little anecdote. I was on the Founders Committee for Wyoming Catholic College in, in Wyoming. And one of the things they do did from the very beginning is, uh, you know, they don't they you check your phones in and the students to the to, to the T love it because, you know, yeah. they're free now. They're really free. They don't have to check their Facebook page or their Instagram you know, or they you know, they don't have to Snapchat. They don't have to do anything. You just be with each other. And that's a that's right. freedom. It's a liberation. It's very liberating. Very liberating. I used to, I joke around with people. Said, when I was a kid, or when I was a kid, young man, no, <laughs> when I was a kid, a mobile phone was a phone that had a really long cord. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was awesome. <laughs> they hung on the kitchen wall and had a cord that could stretch all the way into the living room or down oh my the hall. Goodness. Wow. That's yeah. Cool. Mobile phone. Anyway, all right. Uh, benchmark number five, sustained by gospel witness. So maybe you can unpack that here at the end. Right. Yeah. And I kind of conclude with that, um, you know, quoting, of course, the often quoted uh, uh, expression of Paul VI, that modern man listens more willing to witnesses than to teachers. But if he does listen to teachers, it's because they are witnesses. You know, that, that personal example um, of, of, of the faith, um, is so important. And it gets back to what we said earlier. Yeah. Teachers should not fear to quote, teach themselves. I think it's sometimes, uh, they were told in maybe their schools of education, which is another big problem, you know, this secular <laughs> schools of education that are, that are forming yeah. our teachers, you know, are in, in methodology and kind of a utilitarian, uh, mechanism, I call it industrial education. You know, they said, well, don't teach yourself, you know, don't, don't, don't let your personality get in the way of your teaching, you know, where that's just not human, you know, and I think that being a witness means being who you are, being authentic. And, you know, young people have a special antenna for hypocrisy. And so, you know, they, you, 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 if they're, you're not authentic and you're not kind of believing what you're teaching, whatever the topic is, they're going to smell that out. 
And so I think being a, a witness to you, what you value, you know, let your values come in. I mean, not that you proselytize or you kind of try That's to, right. you know, try to, you know, be a, you know, try to convert people or whatever, but that you let yourself come through. You witness to what you believe in an authentic way that becomes real. I mean, that puts flesh and bones on the subject matter that you're teaching. And that goes true for, for math. Really does. You, you know, know that they want, they, they want to know the person. Yeah. Uh, you were cutting out just a little bit there, at least on my end, I hope it comes through, but I, I think it came through loud and clear for the most part, you know, that we, and we talked about this before, you know, no hypocrisy and obviously nobody's perfect and we all are sinners and no one is expecting teachers to be absolute and complete Francis of Assisi or Thomas Aquinas right. or, you know, all wrapped into one, but to, to be duplicitous, no, to, no. to lead uh, double lives of hypocrisy, no, to, to be uh, mean spirited. No, a teacher has to be a lover uh, in the proper sense of that word, you know, uh, and, and actually care. Uh, about the consistency of, of what they're doing. Right. So, okay, so, go ahead. And it, it was you saying a teacher doesn't necessarily, everybody's personality is different. I mean, there are teachers that are very uh, extroverts and, and very spontaneous yeah. and, and good on their feet, but there's others that are shy and introverted, but that's a beauty too, because you got shy and introverted kids in your class, you know, and they're going to be attracted True. to you and they're going to, they're going to, you're going to be approachable to them because they know you're authentic. Yeah, I mean, I was I was not an introvert an introvert as a teacher. I, I was a rather oh, yeah. extroverted teacher. Yeah, I was a little over the top. I was I was known for being kind of outrageous in my classroom. So uh, I tended to attract into my classroom students that really enjoyed being outrageous. So there there was there was a lot of fun in my classes. Sometimes too much, I think too much, and I think sometimes that's what students meant when they'd write in a you know chap would get off topic a lot or whatever. Not so much. I, I don't know how much I really learned that week on blah, blah, blah. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, the point is, is that I always tried to make sure that what I projected to my students was simply who I am with, within right. certain limits, of course. Right. But anyway, be so I think yourself. just be yourself, be yourself. All right. So that those are the five benchmarks. You also here at the end have some suggestions. You talk about Lexio Divina, the limitation of technology, the integration of poetry and literature into the formational process, something that Pope Francis has just recently been talking about. Uh, right. So maybe we could uh, end here with you just talking about some of these recommend based on these benchmarks, some of these recommendations that you give for Catholic schools going forward. Yeah, I think that um, it's sort of like looking again, getting back to that word uh, integrated, you know, that, that that our educational experience is fully integrated, both, you know, with the, um, you know, the, the, the actual content of what we learn, but also the pedagogy, the way that it's taught, and yeah. then the, uh, the, the, the spiritual and the natural. So you have opportunities, um, at least in Catholic schools, to be able to learn how to pray, you know, and to and really to learn how to to deeply pray and to have an encounter with God in your school and with through your your mates, your yeah. That um, I read my way into the Catholic Church, you know. I had this intellectual, yes. you know. I, I yes. read all these great books, you know. And believe me, I was not an honor student, and I was not the brightest bulb on the tree, um, but I fell in love with what I was reading. But as I get older and I look back and I say, you know, it was more, it was not so much an intellectual awakening that was happening, but it was a, a movement of the heart. It was the friendships I made. It was the experiences that I had with my, you know, fellow sojourners, you know, and, and that kind of community and that kind of, uh, you know, uh, integrated experience in the edu in education, it is it, 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 like I said, it's much more than information transfer. It's transformation. It transformed me into who I am today, and that's what uh, these points I'm trying to make here um, can do to us. Uh, they can help us to have a full whole person experience, not just the brain, but the whole person, physically, emotionally, um, intellectually, yeah. spiritually. 
that means the heart and this brings up and i, I want to end with this because then maybe someday we can do a follow-up podcast on this if you're open to it which is then you run into these logistical pro this is all the great sort of methodological, ideological, theological superstructure. But you also mention in here, there are financial constraints. And, uh, and, and part of those financial constraints is this, that none of this works, none of it, unless you have the right faculty in place. Right. Personnel is policy. You can't have a Catholic school that's doing all these Catholic things without hiring Catholics who know how to do these Catholic things and to do them well. So then you have to turn to universities and Catholic universities and colleges that are cranking out just such people. They don't grow on trees. Right. Uh, are there enough Catholic universities and colleges that are cranking out Catholic mathematicians, Catholic English teachers, Catholic historians, and so on, in order to truly reform and renew our Catholic schools out there along the lines of the model that you're suggesting here? Uh, and of course, all of that then costs money. You've got to pay these teachers a competitive salary. You have to give them competitive health benefits. And, you know, gone are the days of religious orders, staffing schools, 90 percent. of You know, uh, and so these are all tremendous challenges that that have to be faced. Right. Right. These are these are the two big challenges. But I see a lot of hope, Larry. I do. Now, the education schools, um, I think, are pretty hopeless, uh, and, at least at the yes. big universities. Um, but I know that there are uh, all kinds of teacher formation programs. And, and again, thinking outside the box, you know, maybe it's not out of a, out of a school of education that you find your teachers. And this is where we have to look at state laws and, and, and to look at ways to yes. bring people into the educational space. Who maybe don't have the, you know, accredited, uh, you know, but they're excellent teachers, you know, and we have to... As you probably know, Nebraska is one of the most regulated states in the country when it comes to education because we have such a, a good public school system. You're a product of it. Um, yes. But, but you know, we also, it constricts us and we have, be, we have to be able to form teachers. We have to go upstream, you know, to get young people. And there's where I see a lot of hope because I see a lot of young people who are coming, who, who want to go into education, who are on fire with the faith, who maybe are former focus missionaries, who've done mission work, they're great teachers. They're great gifted teachers. We got to figure out a way to get them certified and into our schools. Mission-minded teachers, you know, not maybe the standard way of going yeah. getting a degree in education, et cetera, masters, whatever. Uh, and also, there are there are a lot of organizations. There's a whole renewal going on underground of formation, and even in these schools, like kids coming out of these small Catholic schools who are, want to teach and who have had this great foundation and formation. Um, and then secondly, we have to figure out how to finance our schools. And that's where I think that, you know, again, um, school choice, there's a tsunami, a wave of school, of school choice bills and legislatures all over the country, including Nebraska. And we're the number 49th in the, in the country. To, we pass this little, I don't know if you follow politics here, we pass a little small you know, it's called the Opportunity yeah. Scholarship App. It's a little bank account. $10 million was is nothing compared to the billion-dollar budget of the state to help assist free and reduced lunch kids, you know, kids that cannot afford tuition. Um, and that's going to help us because it's yeah. going to grow. It's only going to grow. It's going to help us in teacher salary to pay them. You know, right right now, we're not up to what the, the public school teachers can, can be paid. But um, I think with that, with scholarship, scholarship opportunities... A continued, um, you know, continued investment of time in, into teaching that will help solve that nut. But those are the two big challenges. Certainly are, and we do need more school choice legislation. I mean, there are some nations that understand this, where, you know, parents pay taxes into the educational pool, and then the government just divvies up that education money equally to all the various schools out there, public and private, and hands it over to them and says, "Here right. you go." Uh, you raise, because you that the empowers the parents. That empowers the parents. Exactly. It's all good for the society. It's not like us versus them. You know, we can't give any money to the Catholics because that's separation of church and state. Well, we could go down that. You talk about more rabbit holes to go yeah. down the history. The history of that in the United States is uh, is checkered to say the least, and tied almost directly to an anti-Catholic oh. uh, Blaine amendments, the whole Blaine nine yards. Right. Oh, the my goodness. Thing, you know, but anyway, yeah. that's we don't want to we, we, we've made our point in that regard. So we don't necessarily want to go. There. So I, I just want this has been a stellar conversation. Where can people access this document of yours? 
Well, actually, this is um, it'll be it'll be published on September third. I don't know when this podcast is going to be put out there, but I'll probably be put out later tonight. So I'll you know tomorrow is September third. Okay, so tomorrow the feast of Saint Gregory the Great, the patron saint of our seminary here in the diocese of Lincoln. Um, it'll be published uh, tomorrow, and it'll be on our website. We're going to have it also in hard copy, uh, but it can be accessed uh, on the website. Just, website, just go to the Lincoln Diocese, and you'll find it there. Um, and it'll be a nice printer-friendly copy with a nice uh, photo on the front of uh, school kids in a school. Um, and, and it also will be available um, in, in our diocese newspaper as well. So um, Very good. Be, uh, we're going to push it out as far far and wide as we can. That's good. I'm hitting the road tomorrow to hit, like I said, to head out to Nebraska. So I'm going to try and get this video up on YouTube and Podbean tonight. Uh, but I'll then later on in this week edit the 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 thing to then post the link uh, from your diocesan webpage so people can access the document. Right, and I think I sent you a final copy of it. Um, so you, you did. I that's right. Maybe I could uh, even just tag the. But I don't want to do that. I want people to actually click on your okay, good diocesan that'll, page. Yeah, I want them be, to go to your page. I think that'd be better. Because anyway. there's uh, we've got I, I, Archbishop Chapu very kindly wrote an uh, an op-ed piece good. to accompany the, the the to accompany this pastoral letter. He's my former boss in Denver, so he uh, he wrote a very nice piece. I forgot me. about that. That's right. That's right. Sorry, I see All right. Well, thank you. Any last words you want to leave with the viewers? Only one thing, and I think this is, I, I, I see this and I believe this in on a hopeful note. There is a whole, I use the word tsunami too much, but there's a whole underground tsunami happening in the, in the world of education. Whether you talk about the, um, you know, like for instance, the Chesterton Academies, which are exploding at the high yes. school. Diocesan school systems now, the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education, which was really a small little group that started about 12 years ago, is it can't hire people half, uh, fast enough because dioceses now are wanting to have this renewal of education because they see, you know, that w the w the direction we've been going is not the right direction. We want to reframe everything, and and and, and recapture the great treasures of of Catholic education that we have in our store chests, our, our treasury chests. That's chest. great. So I see this, the, you know, like we mentioned, the homeschooling movement, you know, all these different movements that are that are really hopeful signs. And I think as 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 society gets more and more chaotic, I think we're going to be like a beacon of light, you know, to in the whole area and space of education. So I I, I have great hope. I have great hope too, and uh, so I, and that's why I, I read this document with such interest and. And once I link to it, I hope everybody that's listening to this podcast takes the time. It's not a hugely long document, but it's chock full of wisdom. Bishop Conley, well, my old friend, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great, Larry. Always enjoy it. All right. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye now.